Welcome to the Bar Exam Toolbox Podcast. Today we are welcoming the CEO of Adaptabar, Tarek Fidel. Your Bar Exam Toolbox hosts are Allison Monahan and Lee Burgess. That's me. We're here to demystify the bar exam experience so you can study effectively, stay sane, and hopefully pass and move on with your life. We're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the career-related website Career Dicta. Allison also runs the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review on your favorite listening app and check out our sister podcast, the Law School Toolbox Podcast. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach us via the contact form on barexamtoolbox.com, and we'd love to hear from you. And with that, let's get started. Welcome back. Today, we are looking forward to our discussion with guest Tarek Fidel, the CEO of Adaptabar. So thanks for joining me today on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm glad to meet you virtually in person. <laughs> maybe, maybe someday we can meet and have coffee. But you know, for now, this is pretty good technology. Um, <clears throat> my team has been using Adaptabar for years. And uh, it was I'm really looking forward to talking more about this product on the podcast to raise awareness for our listeners and to really make sure that they understand not only what you guys offer, but how they can make the most out of the tool. So to get things kicked off, can you just tell me a bit about the story of the history of Adaptabar? I think you started the company in 2003, which although that doesn't sound like very long ago, is actually a while ago, (laughs) which makes me feel old. Um, So how did you decide to move your legal career in the direction of being an entrepreneur and joining this bar prep space? Yeah, so the genesis of Adaptabar is kind of an interesting story, and I'm not sure I'm not sure if I would classify it as a as a decision that was made by me. I was almost decided for me, but um, you know, there's kind of plenty of things that came together to sort of put me in the right place in the right time uh, to have this idea. The the first is is that before I started law school, um, so I should have started law school in 1997 after graduating college, but. Um, that was the, the, the Y2K years. So um, during and after college, I got involved in technology at a very um, kind of practical level with Y2K. And, there were, and people were making so much money in the industry, they needed bodies. And so, uh, so I did that for three years to sort of cash in on that, on that trend. And uh, so in 2000, when everybody had finished uh, spending all of their money and the corporations were done and the earth kept turning... Um, they, uh, I, I decided I would start law school. So I, w- I kind of went into law school with sort of a technology focused, uh, mindset. And, mm-hmm. um, and so, and during law school, I, um, uh, I ended up becoming president of the student bar association at Kent. And, uh, and because of that, you automatically, because, uh, the founder of Barbary, Richard Convisor, is a professor there. The SBA president automatically becomes a Barbary head rep. So that's sort of my entry <laughs> into, funny. yeah, so I had never worked for Barbary or sold, you know, and it's kind of a different animal at Kent um, because of his, him being there, uh, because of him teaching there. So uh, so that was my first introduction into the bar prep space, right? And so, you know, of course, I I mean, I had no idea, right? Barbary's the biggest uh um, bar prep program sounded great to me. Um, so I got Barbary for free for being a head rapper at a great, at a significant discount. I don't remember which. And, um, and then of course, you know, right before graduation then everybody was saying, um, well, you have to take this course that at the time was called PMBR. So, um, because they would say, well, Barbary's questions are super easy and PMBR's questions are super hard. And so to get the, the good, a balance of questions, you need to take both courses. So, right. you know, whatever. I mean, I was a sheep like any other, and so I followed the third. Yeah. I did the exact same thing in 2008. That yeah. was like the exact same exactly. <laughs> party line. I mean, who know, <laughs> you know, we don't know anything about this. We just do what everybody else is doing and hope for the best. So, right. um, you know, so then I, when, when it came time, it was, it was 4th of July weekend, and it came time to um, go into this supplemental MBE course, and, you know, at the time, nothing was online, not even Barbary. And so we had to go to this um, to this banquet hall at this hotel in Chicago. And there's like, I don't know, 2,000 people in this room. And we take this sample test that's made up of all fake questions from, you know, fake questions, uh, uh, fake MBE questions. And, mm-hmm. and then the following two days, 
um, they stand up there and like read the explanations to you. And, and my friend <laughs> yeah. and I, my best friend from law school and I looked at each other and we're like, it's four, excuse me, it's 4th of July weekend. It's sunny outside. You know, we don't need to be stuck in here. There's picketers outside, like, uh, you know, union picketers outside making all kinds of ruckus. And we're like, listen, we're not illiterate. Like we can go, we could read this on somebody's rooftop deck or sit outside, like catch some, catch some rays. So I had become increasingly frustrated throughout the process of studying for the bar because I, you know, I think most people would say that I'm a relatively impatient person. So for me, it was like, look, I, I know some things. I, I know I don't know some things. I need to know what I don't know. I need to know what I don't know very quickly so that I can get to that. And I'm just not very good at spending, you know, I'm not one of those that can spend 12 hours a day in the library seven days a week that's just a miserable process for me i'm more kind of like the one that sort of skates by like most people do and then come fourth of july you kind of like kick it into high gear and that's when you really start studying mm -hmm. so you know and, and sometimes that's a bad idea so for for most people it's not it's not great never a recommended practice <laughs> but so during the process, I was looking for something online because I had heard during the, my time in, in the IT industry, I had done certification exams and I knew all of those were computer based where you go to like a testing center and you take an exam. Uh, so I knew that this kind of thing existed, right? And I knew of this new thing called adaptive testing where they essentially take you know, an exam that could be 100 questions long, but based on your answers, it could also be mm -hmm. as short as 15 questions. And I thought, well, you know, that seems like the smartest way of doing it. Well, why couldn't, why can't I find something that one, does all these calculations instead of me answering a question in a book, then flipping to the back to the answer, and then what, I'm recording all of this information on paper, like whether I got it yeah. right and wrong, and what's the subtopic, and how do we break it down, and is it broken down the same way as the National Conference of Bar Examiners breaks down the actual exam? And so this is, you know, extremely cumbersome. I mean, I know people did it for decades, but for me, it was just annoying. And so I didn't find anything that was even remotely like that. And so the idea kept weighing on my mind. So coincidentally, I had taken a class, a seminar class in my third semester of law school, and I had this, this technology, legal technologist who is uh, a genius. He's, um, he's a, he was a legal rebel for the ABA. He's like, he's just mm -hmm. a technology genius. And, um, and so I, I was fortunate enough to have him as a professor and uh, we had become close because there was only three people in the seminar class. Um, and so I, I kind of came up with this idea and I thought, what if I created this online and it did this and it did that and it adjusted the presentation of questions and, you know, we'll kind of get to more of the features of what Adaptive Bar does later. But I thought, okay, this, this sounds like a decent idea. Let me call this guy and let me ask him what he thinks of it because he was the first person that came to mind. So I called yeah. him and this, now this is like three weeks before the bar, maybe even two <laughs> weeks before the bar. <laughs> so, so probably not recommended to try and do business <laughs> no. entrepreneurship three weeks before the bar no not not <laughs> conducive to studying not conducive. right so uh you know so I, so I called him and i said what do you think about this idea and i explained it to him and his response to me was i think the idea is brilliant and if you're willing to do it i'm willing to mentor you through it and mm -hmm. you know it's like i mean when you hear that from a guy that's that respected um right. You know, that pretty much made the decision for me. I mean, I would have been stupid to not do it. So uh, um, so that was it. I mean, that was essentially it. And then the next couple of days were, okay, this is twofold. One, um, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about this and the bar is coming up. Two, uh, future bar prep guy, probably bad idea to go into the exam and fail it. Right. And three, <laughs> although I know that, <laughs> although I know that, I know essentially what I'm looking for and what would make this program great. You don't really know what can make it great until you're a client, right? Like the head old hair club guy or whatever. So you have to actually use the, pro I wanted to use the program and I wanted to depend on it so that I knew, okay, these are the refinements that I need to make. So I made the decision that I was going to blow off the exam. Well, I was going to withdraw. I didn't just not mm -hmm. show up. So I withdrew from the exam 
And I was going to come back and I kind of calculated it out and figured, okay, I can come back a year and a half later and I can take the exam using the program, but I needed time to get it up off the ground, start it up, get it right. off the ground and then come back. So that's what I did. So, and I, you know, and the funny part of this is that I didn't want to create any drama for my friends because they were all studying for the bar. And, you know, two weeks out, it's like, there's very little communication with your friends. Everybody kind of goes into lockdown mode. So no one knew anything. Right. So right. I didn't tell anybody anything. Uh, the only person that knew at the time was my girlfriend. Um, and, and then uh, <laughs> come the bar exam day, that's the second day at the end of the bar exam in Illinois, our school had a... Um, a, like a, a, a party after the exam. So you, you show mm -hmm. up at a bar and they buy the drinks and everything and you're socializing. And so I showed up, I showed up <laughs> because I thought, you know, it would be weird not, right? So I showed up as if I had taken the exam and, uh, you know, my best friend comes up to me and he's like, oh man, that was really something else. And I was like, yeah, you know, I, there's something that I have to tell you about that. And then, and so I told him and he, I mean, I'll just never, as long as I live, I'll never forget the look on his face. And he's like, what? Like, are you joking, right? Like, it's not even possible that you did that. And I'm like, no, I, I'm serious. So after everybody got over the shock, um, that, you know, that's really why it came to be. And so, you know, basically it's like, you know, the best ideas come from something that's missing in the market. And so, right. you know, and because I was sort of technology focused and I had had some experience in other industries and I knew that they had this kind of thing, even though it wasn't, it was more for the testing rather than for the preparation, it kind right. of all just came together. And, and, you know, and the other major thing too, is that I didn't have any really great job prospects. Like I was doing pretty well before I went to law school. And so the idea of making half as much after being, I don't know, $180,000 in debt from law school uh, right. didn't sound too great, right? Like I couldn't take yeah. the government job. So, yeah. um, so I immediately got to work with, um, with finding somebody who could build this because I don't know how to program or anything. So I needed marketing. I needed somebody to build it and somebody that would do it cheap. And yeah. um, so, you know, long story short, I found a company that could do that. And then we got to work right away. Uh, we started in August and then we launched um, in on Valentine's Day. So it was February 14th of 2004. We launched the program uh, for the July session. And uh, for the July 2004 session, and yeah. I think the July 2004 session, we had, I think, 76 users, mm -hmm. you know, pretty interesting from where we've come now. Uh, <laughs> Wait, you, you have more than 76? Yeah, I, just, I, just, <laughs> I think I know I like 76 of your users. <laughs> yeah. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so that's the, uh, so that's the genesis of Adapt Bar, kind of an interesting, and so I did end up going back. Uh, taking the exam, using the program, making the refinements that I needed to use the program, and, and you know, and it worked out. And thank God I passed the exam because, you know, it's not always the best story to say, oh, yeah, I used my program, and then I <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah but it's, it works great. You should definitely sign up for it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> that wasn't the reason I failed. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I think that's really fascinating. Well, I feel like Allison, my business partner, should be doing this uh, meeting with you because she also did uh, had a technology background before going to law school. Um, oh, really? So I'm sure you guys could have your own elevated technology conversation. Yeah, that's um, fun. Yeah, so we'll we'll do that offline another time. <laughs> I'm sure she'd love to chat with you about it. Absolutely. Um, well, I think that's such a fascinating story, and um, and it, and what I like about your story, which I think is a lot of what I like about your tool is that it is very focused on like that it actually works and that it is bringing students to um, kind of where they need to be in order to pass this exam. And of course the adaptive technology, my big, one of my big passions is studying smart, not wasting a lot of time. Yeah. And one of the things that students really appreciate is the fact that, you know, the tool itself is pretty smart. And so you're not, you know, just spinning your wheels. So for people who aren't familiar with the tool at all, um, what are kind of, what's kind of a quick rundown of how it works and why it helps people prepare for the multiple choice portion of the MB? Yeah, absolutely. So, so I always, so the kind of the elevator pitch of Adaptivar is that it consists really of two main features uh, that make it so effective. The first is the 
having the best technology and standardized test preparation. And I say that because we use patented technology. So to kind of go back to the initial story, so this legal technologist, um, he and I actually co-invented this technology. And then this guy is just such a philanthropist that he ended up just assigning it over to the company, didn't want anything but maybe to you know, pick my brain when he starts a company later. And now he's got a company that is, you know, competing with Google. I mean, the guy's just crazy. But so, you know, so I had this resource. Um, and so we developed the most advanced technology and standardized test preparation, patented it for, for standardized test prep, as opposed to just the application of this technology to the bar exam. And what it does is two main things. It First, it adjusts the presentation of questions based on a user's strength and we- strengths and weaknesses. So it's always emphasizing areas of weakness without neglecting areas of strength. But the key mm-hmm. thing that it does is it takes it a step further and makes sure to take into consideration how often particular questions in or particular subtopics, I should say, are tested on the actual exam. So for example, you know that um, half of the questions in tort come from negligence and you know very few generally i mean in recent in in recent times they've combined strict liability and product liability because they were two relatively small subtopics but so now there's four subtopics on the exam and so they say that um they say that half of the questions come from negligence they being the ncbe that half the questions on the exam come from negligence and the other half of the questions come from the other three now or four before subtopics. And so you could derive from that that 12.5% of the questions in torts are going to come from strict liability. But when you look at the actual exams, you see that it's really only 2.5%. Mm-hmm. So what would be so so when I say that the program emphasizes areas of weakness um, without neglecting areas of strength, that means that if you're doing 100% accuracy, let's say, in negligence, and you're getting 5% accuracy in strict liability, you're still probably going to see more negligence. Que- well, I know you're going to see more negligence questions than you do strict liability because no matter what or no matter how bad you're doing, it's stupid to spend more time studying a subtopic that is just not highly tested. And so yeah. this goes to the whole, I mean, the whole, everything about this program is designed for efficiency. And so efficient test taking would say that this is how it's supposed to be done. And it's also, the, 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 the algorithm is very subtle in the sense that it adjusts the presentation of questions, but it doesn't do it in such a way that it becomes annoying. Because as, as everybody knows, if, you're, if your weakness is real property like mine was, then mm-hmm. there's only so much time that you can spend in real property before you want to slit your wrists. So right. you can't feel bad about yourself all the time. So although you know that you need to emphasize that area of weakness, you're going to do it for so long, and then you're going to move to something like, let's say, torts that's going to reinforce that, okay, I'm, I'm not really as dumb as I might think. Right. Well, I, can, I might still pass this test. Right, exactly. <laughs> so. like, I can do this. But so adaptive art does it so subtly that really until after you're done, let's say doing a set of 50 questions, you're not really going to know, oh, look at that. I answered more real property questions than I did torts questions because it mixes it up in such a way that you are emphasizing those areas of weakness, but it's just not in that brutal way of like, okay, let me turn to the real property section of the book and just do it over and over. And so that's what's nice about it. And I think what's so important when you think about studying for the bar from like a global perspective, what what makes it so different than law school, I think, is when you were studying for a law school exam, you know, you do this deep dive in to try to get a mastery of the subject, you know, so before you took your torts exam, you're spending a week memorizing all these rules, you know, cases and nuances and all that stuff. And I think it's shocking to the system when you get to the bar, when there's this, there's this kind of like, game theory and strategy behind it yeah. where it's like okay um yeah like i'm not going to spend all like i'm not going to spend a whole day studying strict liability and torts if it's a very very small likelihood <laughs> i'm going to see you know a huge number of those questions and it's probably you know may or may not show up on a an exam you shouldn't know nothing about it but you're, you can't spend a whole day on it. <laughs> it's like the, you you know you have to be strategic and so it's like we use a tool in-house and that we also sell online called the Brainy Bar Bank, which is 
you know, allows you to do frequency analysis for issues in essays for the MBE in, Ca in the California bar. And one of the things we tell our students is you got to go in and see what are the most heavily tested subjects? What are the most heavily tested issues within those subjects? Make sure you know all those first. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's like, don't ignore those because Absolutely. those are probably going to show up on your test. And they do almost every time. Absolutely. And that's, you know, that's, it's interesting because that's the sex so the second part of the patented technology is goes to what you just said about um, making sure that you move on and, and you know, and, and em emphasizing efficiency. So the second part of the algorithm is that it will calculate a user's optimal timing. So everybody mm -hmm. knows that when you walk into a conventional bar prep class or a comprehensive bar prep class, that they'll tell you that you have on average 1.8 minutes to answer each question. But everybody also knows that a, a crim law or evidence question is going to take you probably, I don't know, let's say 1.2, 1.3 minutes. A real property or SIP pro question might take you 2.3 minutes. And those could be your optimal times for those subjects. Right. What Adaptive Art does is it figures out what your optimal time is in each subject and based on that calculation when you answer a question it will tell you something like you answered this question in 42 seconds had you spent an additional 15 seconds reviewing this question and answers your chances of answering correctly would have increased from 25 percent to 75 percent inversely if you spend too much time on a question it'll say you should have abandoned this question x number of seconds ago because your chances of answering correctly decreased from x to y and so that seems like a lot of information on a per question basis. But the point is, is that Adaptabar will complain and give you that feedback when it's sensing that your optimal timing in a particular subject is inconsistent with the amount of time that you have for the exam. So it'll take your 1.2 optimal time in, in subject A, your 1.4 optimal time in subject B, it'll put it all together and say, okay, well, every law of averages, w what happens here? Like, how does this end up for you completing the one section of 100 questions on the MBE? And so when you're answering, when you're taking too much time on that property question, it'll complain. The information maybe is a little bit overload. So students sometimes say, well, what am I supposed to do with that? Like, the, nothing. Just pay attention to right. it. Pay, just pay attention to the fact that Adaptive is complaining. When you speed it up a little bit, as Adaptive Bar is asking you to do, then eventually it will stop complaining that your timing is, is off because you will eventually start to move that needle in a uh, safe zone, so to speak. So all you need to do is just pay attention to the fact that you're going over or you're being too hasty. And the interesting thing that most students don't know is that um, it's always, well, back in the day, I mean, before the introduction of civil procedure, evidence and criminal law, which are typically the shortest questions on the exam in terms of the shortest fact patterns, and real property, which, were, which tended to be the longest fact patterns, those subjects were always vying for worst performing on the exam. And the reason mm. why is because people spend way too much time on property and after it becomes so convoluted that, you know, the chances of answering correctly are like almost nil. And when a question is really short, students tend to jump the gun and say, okay, well, th this seems like an obvious answer. So it kind of makes you speedy, kind of gives you this subliminal message that you can like speed through this question so that you have more time on the, on the long one. But, yeah. you know, in, in, in essence, what happens is that students will spend too much time on those property or civ pro questions or whatever it is that's your particular weakness. And then at the end of the exam, you don't have time to, to get to a question that you probably had a 75% chance of getting correct. And so yeah. that is probably the one feature of Adaptive Bar that I would say is the least valued until after a student walks out of the exam and says, oh my God, it, I understand now because timing is not, it was not an issue for me. You mm -hmm. know, so it's, it's, this is another subliminal sort of, um, you know, timing adjustment. And everybody, everybody, you know, some people will say, oh, I don't have a chance. I don't have a problem with my timing. I finished the MBE 40 minutes early. Well, unless you're getting 100% accuracy, yeah. that's a problem. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's like, that's great. Did you pass it? Were you in the top 90th some percentile? Yeah, timing, <laughs> timing issues are not just I ran out of time. They're I didn't right. spend enough time where I should have. 
So yeah. those are the two. So those are the two features of the technology. So take that and combine that with the most accurate questions and you get the most accurate diagnosis. And we've always felt that the questions that are licensed from the National Conference of Bar Examiners are the best representation of what students are going to see on the actual exam. Now, the examiners have, you know, made modifications and we, you know, and I'll kind of get into that, like what really, what sets Adaptabar apart from other people that say they've got good technology and use licensed questions. But essentially those two things are what makes Adaptabar so great. Is, and Adaptabar is not a course like Barbary or Themis or Wood Kaplan or whoever it is. It's a diagnostic tool. And so the mm -hmm. thing that we emphasize to students the most is keep in mind two main things that students do that to their detriment most often is one, they study for each subject the same way. So they think that they can do the same method of preparation for each subject, and that is not the case at all. And two, right. they think that the questions are their primary source of substantive review, and that's not the case at all either. Although you're going to learn from answering an MBE question and reading the explanation, it's not your primary source of substantive review. If you answer 50 questions in torts, you're going to know what you know and what you don't know exactly the same way as if you answer 100 questions in torts, you're still going to know that you're getting 53%. It was just, this was 53% of 100 questions instead of a 50. So the point right. is, answer enough questions in Adaptive Bar that you think about what your diagnosis is, where your weaknesses are, and then take a break from the questions, address those weaknesses in the outlines. Because we break it down in such a granular way, you don't have to go to a 110-page torts outline. You can go specifically to the section of, the, of your Barbary outlines or whatever you're using that cover um, products liability or intentional torts. So because that's where your weakness is in adaptive art. Right. And I really, I do like that about the tool because so often somebody will give me feedback because our tutoring students use this tool and then they'll say, well, I'm struggling in real property. And I'm like, well, you're not struggling with all of real property. Right. So like you have to, you know, like take, take a screenshot of this, of the reporting and let me know like what are the parts <laughs> like let's let's get drilled down and then let's make sure that you're not just studying what you do know because i think that that is a place where uh, in all parts of bar prep whether it be for the mbe or the writing portion that students can trip up is they spend too much time studying the stuff that they know because it's comforting and it makes you feel smart and uh, the problem is that's not what you need to be studying. If you know it and you're doing well on it, <laughs> you, just, exactly. you need to be studying on those pain points. We've got a blog post that I always reference that was written by one of the tutors on my team um, called, you need to study what makes you uncomfortable. Like if you're feeling really great about yourself during your bar prep and you're like, I am rocking this, <laughs> you're probably studying the wrong stuff <laughs> because like, there's, there's plenty of stuff that you won't be rocking. Like really, I'd, I've, none of us really felt like we were knocking it out of the park <laughs> before we went into the desk. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I mean, I swear that even though I know it is statistically impossible, that there were like 50 mortgages questions on my MBE. I swear. <laughs> I wish I had like tallied them. The whole morning session uh, when I took the MBE, and, and, you know, a lot of it's because they mix it up. And so you never know. I mean, it is possible you get more, you know, property questions in the morning and in the afternoon or whatever. But, I mean, it felt like every few questions. And I was just like, I don't know anything about mortgages. <laughs> like, please worst. stop asking me questions. <laughs> That's the worst. Oh, yeah. I definitely, that was the, that was, at that point, California was a three-day exam. So that was lunch of the second day. And I, I definitely went back to my hotel room. And that was the first time I was like, this might not be going so well. This might, <laughs> this, this might have taken a turn for the worst. I, mean, I can't imagine taking three days. I mean, two days is grueling enough. Yeah, I mean, I, I was pretty surprised when California took it down to the two days, only because I think it was such a badge of honor. The yeah. California lawyers, you know, could wear this like three day badge of honor, like we suffered um, through. But, uh, you know, two days is pretty miserable, too. Um, but uh, I remember the morning of the MBE, my father, who's who's a lawyer, sent me a text and he said, uh, at least, you know, the answers on the page. That's right. <laughs> I guess that's true. That's true. <laughs> Well, a few of the things that I think our students really love um, about this product and that we've gotten feedback for is I love the fact that you use the licensed questions uh, because I, I think it's 
I think it's foolish to study off of non-licensed questions, to be honest. Yeah. Um, because they're not the best representation of what's actually on the test. And I think oftentimes people forget how vetted actual questions are. Yeah. Um, I did some SAT prep um, part-time to make money while I was in law school. And that was kind of the first time I really got thinking about experimental questions and how, you know, how the kind of a rigorous testing that real questions have gone through. So, you know, a licensed question has gone through that testing, even if it's retired. And I think that that makes a difference. You know, it can only be so ambiguous if it's made it through that rigorous testing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the best analogy that I've ever given for this is, is, you know, when you're in your first year classes, if you're when you're in your torts class, your first year in law school, and your professor says, my past exams are up in the library with model answers, you don't go out there and check out a different professor's exams. Right. One <laughs> author writes a question in a particular way and expects you to answer it in a particular way. And although the questions are going to be completely different than what you see on your final exam, you can gauge how, what this particular professor is looking for. And it's the same thing with the license questions. It just doesn't make any sense. Not to and they can only get so creative. I mean, Absolutely. that's the other thing. It's like they test these issues you know, after a while, you do start to see the patterns of them being tested in similar ways. Absolutely. And I think you see this with the writing portion, too. Um, like people oftentimes are really nervous when they come to California uh, because Cal California community property is tested. And if you didn't go to school in California, you may think that is like something completely wackadoodle and you don't know anything about it. And so it's like, OK, well, yeah, learn some com community property. It's, it's statutory. It's not you know, it's not super crazy or out there or theoretical. But then if you do like 10 community property questions, you will see that there's only so much they can test about yeah. the same stuff in you know, the same types of fact patterns with slight modifications, the same nuances are tested over and over again, because those issues are right for the testing. And I think the MBE is the same way, you know, they're going to test prior bad acts only so many different ways and evidence. Um, you know, the H1 might feel torturous, but they can only do it so many times. Absolutely. If you do enough of them, you're going to start to see these are the these are the facts that these questions turn on. And I need to be aware of that. Yeah, absolutely. Totally. And we are a big fan of your algorithms because as we were just talking about um, studying smart is a big deal for us. And I think efficient study and focusing on weak areas uh, while not ignoring the other heavily tested areas is important. One of the things that I find is underutilized by a lot of people that I know that use the tool is your reporting element of really being able to say, where am I? How is it going? What's going well? What's going poorly? And and doing that substantive review that's very targeted. I think people don't like, they think there's something like scary and negative in that reporting. It's like going <laughs> to... I don't know. I don't know. It's like nobody wants negative feedback and like something in there. I mean, if I went and did a hundred question set on Adaptive Bar, I'm sure it would tell me nasty things too. <laughs> it's just, Absolutely. Uh, you know, but it would tell me that there are certain, like I, it's probably telling me I still don't know anything about mortgages is what it would probably tell me even after yeah. all these years. Yeah. Um, so, but you know what, you can run a bar prep program and, and not teach people much about <laughs> mortgages. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> throw that out there. <laughs> Um, but I, I do think that being willing to really work the tool and, and get this advice on how to spend your time is incredibly important um, because, you know, studying what you already are comfortable with doesn't get you over that hump. Um, so you need to know, like, where those pain points are and then do that substantive review Absolutely. to get more comfortable with the law. Absolutely. Um, I think one thing, you know, we haven't talked much about is its portability. And I think that this is a big thing, especially we are seeing more and more students, especially repeat takers um, of the bar who are working and studying. And I think the portability of your tool is something that a lot of students really appreciate. Yeah. Um, because those books are heavy. Absolutely. <laughs> they're, they're really heavy. And, um, and a lot of my working and studying students have told me that the nice thing is, you know, if they have a lunch, an hour at lunch, they can log in and do, feel like they're doing some actual work because there's not much ramp up time. Whereas if you've got your books and your outline, and you're this and you're that, you know, it can take you 15 minutes to feel like you've got your act together. Um, so I think that that's also something that that is, um, that is a feature that a lot of people discredit and it runs on mobile devices and stuff like that. Absolutely. Um, and then I got to say it, your price point com in compared to everything else in Barland, 
which we realized the bar prep is not cheap. <laughs> it is it not is cheap. cheap. Yeah, we're, we're proud of keeping the price where it <clears> is. <throat> we haven't raised it in years. I mean, I, I can't even remember the last time that we raised it. And so we, you know, we try to do things to minimize the costs and be more efficient. I mean, just as though we, it's the same way that we create an efficient program, we like to run an efficient company so that we're not wasting and bloating and continuing to raise the price. And we're extremely conscious of the cost that students have to incur now uh, for legal education. So we're proud of keeping the price the same. And I think a lot of students, you know, <clears throat> there is that barrier when you're thinking about your bar prep um, and you're weighing your own strengths and weaknesses. You know, one of the things we talk about um, on our team a lot is really being able to evaluate how you need to prep. You know, you were talking about your own experience of prepping for the bar of realizing that like some of this wasn't exactly working for you. I had a similar experience around 4th of July, although I decided not, I didn't, I think I went and had wine with my mom. I don't think I started a business. <laughs> Um, but <laughs> so maybe that's, that's a fundamental difference between you and I, but, um, but of like realizing that I needed to take ownership of this process and I needed to study in the way that I knew I was going to get results or this was not going to go well for me. And, um, and so I think that as you're putting together what you need, just that reminder that, you know, we all come to this experience with different academic backgrounds, with different academic um, successes and failures and strengths and weaknesses. And you have to decide financially where you're going to place the money to help create a package that is the most creates the highest likelihood of success for you. So if MBEs or multiple choice have plagued you from your SAT days, then maybe that's somewhere where you need to say, what kind of other choices could I make to maybe do some cost shift cost shifting within my bar prep to make sure I get as much multiple choice help as I can, because that's been my problem area. And then there are those infuriate, infuriating people who are just really good at multiple choice, who don't maybe don't have to worry about that. And you know, good for them, believe for them. <laughs> but um, a lot of us, you know, have had to study for these standardized tests. And so I think, you know, if you're a 3L, and you're listening to this, that would be one something I really want you to think about is, you know, what's going to create a prep that's successful for you? Because nobody's really going to ask you, like, unless you do a podcast with me, and then we talk about how you prepped for the bar, like how you prep for the bar. Right. They just they just care if you have a bar card. That's true. Yeah. So you've got to be thoughtful about it. And the party line of do everything that everybody else is doing, it works for some people, but it doesn't work for a lot of people. Like in some jurisdictions, like half of the people. Right. So you do have to really evaluate, you know, what are your needs? Absolutely. Um, I'll get off my soapbox now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so one the question that's come up from students who use the tool, though, that I was interesting to interested to get your thoughts on is the pros and cons of practicing multiple choice questions on the computer instead of on paper, since for now, uh, the, the MBE portion of the exam is still taken on paper. Yeah. Uh, do you think that there's a fundamental difference or have you gotten that feedback um, from students at all? Yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, pe people have said that. I, I think most people get it um, more so now than perhaps a decade ago. But, yeah. you know, my, my, I mean, I take a very logical approach to this. You know, like, look, filling in the bubbles here, like by the time you get to the bar exam, I don't know how many times you've done that, but I'm sure you couldn't count it on two two hands. So, although you may not be used to, if you know, if you're studying entirely online and then you have to go in and like fill in the bubbles, then that may be slightly foreign because perhaps you haven't done it in a couple of years. But the thing is, is that the benefits of the technology so far outweigh the detriment of not being used to filling in the bubbles that I just, to me, it's a no brainer. I know that I'm biased mm -hmm. of course, but you know, you just cannot get the kind of information that you need. And technology has become so advanced now that, that the granularity of information is just so accessible right at your fingertips, um, you know, filling in the scantrons and actually <laughs> interestingly enough. So in response to that, uh, request in the new version of Adaptive Bar, the Adaptive Bar 2.0 that we launched at the beginning of this month, there is actually Scantron mode in exams. So if you're oh, really? going to go, yeah. so go in and do 
a, um, a an exam, practice exam, like an OPE, for example, and you're going to do a 100-question exam, you could just, on the right-hand side, you can click Scantron mode, and instead of um, clicking an answer, you would just like fill, you would fill in with your mouse the, the Scantron. There's a virtual okay. Scantron sheet on your, on your screen, you know, and that's kind of, I'll admit that's kind of more of a gimmick. Yeah. I, I just think that anyone that thinks that they are somehow at a, at a, at a um, disadvantage by not preparing on paper should really rethink that because I couldn't disagree more. Yeah. I think if I think one thing that happens is people forget that you know it's it is working on the computer but it's oftentimes you need to like clear your computer of other distractions like you can shut off your email and close other browser windows and right. make it so you're very focused because I I think the computer is such a place of distraction for so many of us Absolutely. um that you know, down the rabbit hole you go of like answering a question and then like, ooh, what's on Facebook or answering a question and like, oh, what happened in the world today? And then you're like, that happened. And then, you know, 25 minutes later, you've come up from the New York Times. Yeah. You have no idea what you were doing. That's a really <laughs> so, good point. It's almost like I've done that before. I don't even yeah, know what I'm absolutely. talking about. <clears throat> but um, so just like turning your phone to silent and like cleaning out your computer um, distractions, I think helps you you know, utilize the tool more like it would be on paper. I think people gravitate towards the paper because it is a simpler um, thing. Do you think they'll ever administer? I mean, maybe someday, but do you think they're moving to someday administering this um, on the computer like they do at the GRE yeah. or? Yeah, they, yeah. Are. they are. I know that they're, I know that the NCB is looking into it. Uh, I don't know what that means. Uh, and so, you know, I, I don't want to disparage them, but the, the pace at which the industry generally moves, uh, yeah. the advancement of technology, is, <laughs> doesn't leave me much uh, confidence that it's going to happen anytime soon. But I could probably, I could fairly say that it would probably happen in my lifetime. Yeah. <laughs> which, in at the speed at which lawyers and bureaucracies move. I mean, that's, that's probably a safe bet. <laughs> yeah, so, okay. yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I do think it's, it's a trap that some students can fall into, which is just discrediting the tool because it's not on paper. Um, Absolutely. I mean, we've all been taking tests on paper forever and you're taking the essay examination on the computer as well. I mean, the taking tests on computers is something that you just have to be okay with at this point. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, before we uh, finish up, because I have a passion for entrepreneurship, clearly, as that's what Allison and I do. Um, you know, what do you think about law school preparing you to be a business or an owner? Do you think that the skills you learned in law school and not just the mentors you found in law school, like helped you learn to think like a business owner versus just think like a lawyer and do legal analysis? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, um, it's not the first time I've been asked that question. And it, it, it's honestly a really hard one to decipher because I think people that have sort of that, that mindset um, generally gravitate towards law school. So I, I think there's no doubt that law school taught me how to think differently. But, you know, unfortunately, I would say that the most beneficial part of law school in terms of being in business now is not necessarily the knowledge that I learned in law school, but the connections that I made in law school. Mm. So it's, yeah. I think it, it has aided me. Well, I mean, so I mentioned my mentor who, you know, none of this would have been possible without him. Uh, but, but then, you know, when you need an attorney and when you need somebody to help you, and one of the things about business owner be, or being a business owner and entrepreneur is um, the key to that, to successfully being an entrepreneur, is figuring out who you are and, like Adaptabar, what, what you know and what you don't know. And the biggest mistake that entrepreneurs or business owners make is thinking that they can be everything to everyone or everything to the company. And that's just not the case. The yeah. progress begins by telling the truth. And so that means telling the truth to yourself about this is something that I'm good at. This is something that I'm not good at. So let me just relinquish this over. And it's something that we entrepreneurs begrudgingly, the term that we use is, is delegation. 
And once mm-hmm. you can delegate that, then um, you're much happier. So yeah. it has it, it has been tremendously beneficial to me as a business owner because I made all those contacts in law school. But you know, no, not in the sense that oh, I learned oh, I remember that oh, I have a contract dispute with a vendor oh, I remember this from no, <laughs> no, no, right, not so much. like like the class I wish I'd paid more attention in was corporations, <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> so, that's all. <clears throat> yeah, whoops. But um, Allison and I also talk about that. One of the things that we got out of law school and our legal experiences, even practicing, was to, we're just really good at learning new stuff. Because I think, you know, yeah. law school teaches you to learn new stuff. And uh, even in practice, you end up um, doing litigation on things that you know nothing about. And one of your jobs is to like, learn about that stuff before you can even talk about litigating it and i think becoming good at learning like you and i were chatting while we were getting the podcast set up of like all the things that you kind of have to learn how to do when you start your own business you know one is knowing when you need to ask for help which is wise (laughs) And, and then use your network but also you know if you don't know how to read balance sheets and do accounting like you would need to go figure that out and like books or classes can teach you that but it helps if you're good at learning So I think one of the things that we often forget about law school is it is kind of this really intensive academic boot camp of how you become curious and you become expert at different things and you research and you communicate. I do think those skills are very transferable. And then, you know, you have to transfer them to a bunch of non-legal skills that you actually need to run a business. Absolutely. I I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Well, this has been fun, but with that, we're unfortunately out of time. So thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to meet with me. I really appreciate it, as I know our listeners do as well. Thank you. If if listeners would like to know more about Adaptabar, you can check out their website, www.adaptabar.com. We'll also link to a number of blog posts and reviews that we have about the tool on our website. If you have specific questions for the Adaptabar team, uh, you can reach out to them through their website, Trust me, they're very nice people and they're very helpful. They answer all sorts of questions. I want to take a second to remind you to check out our blog at baregamtoolbox.com, which is full of helpful tips to help you prepare and stay sane during your study for the bar exam. You can also find information on our website about our courses, tools, and one-on-one tutoring programs to support you as you study for the UBE or California bar exam. If you enjoyed this episode of the Bar Exam Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review and rating on your favorite listening app. We'd really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you're still in law school, you might also like to check out our popular Law School Toolbox podcast as well. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or Allison at lee at baregamtoolbox.com or allison at baregamtoolbox.com. Or you can always contact us via our website contact form at baregamtoolbox.com. We love hearing from you. Thanks for listening and we'll talk soon.